Women Matters on the 9th of September, 2024. And as always, we start with a short check-in. And maybe Gina, as you are the first time, you will have a larger space to to present yourself, to introduce yourself, I think you say in English. And but I would like to start with Monia. She is our you are our elder, aren't you? <laughs> Urgestein. I am the basic rock. <laughs> <laughs> um all right. So it's finally cool in Vienna. We have rain, but not no hailstorms, just normal rain. And yeah, that really helps a lot because I noticed that I don't I don't feel that energetic in the heat anymore as I did before. So I really I'm really happy that autumn has finally arrived. Um Otherwise, there is not much change. I read and write, and my husband is, yeah, he is as he, he tries his best. And yeah, that's about all I have to report from Vienna. Well, we, we will have elections in two weeks, and it's just, yeah, I'm trying to stay away from the media as much as possible. So I really abstain now. <clears throat> and uh, my husband too, finally. But we already filled out the formula, so we already, uh, the form, so we already have voted. And uh, I don't really care anymore. Okay, I pass on to Christine. Good morning. Uh, I'm Christine in Carlsbad, California. Um, it is very warm here. September tends to be the warmest month of the year, and it is certainly that uh, on the coast where our temperatures are very temperate. Well, I don't know if you guys understand Fahrenheit, but it's supposed to be in the probably 87, 88 today on the coast. And inland, as you get into the desert, it can go up to 112. 114. Huge, huge difference between the coast and going inland. But anyway, it's way, it's way too warm. Um, so um, we have, uh, over the weekend, I was supposed to do a outing with a friend celebrating her retirement. And this was the second time she canceled it for um, health reasons. This time it was her husband's health reasons. And the, the thing is, um, she cancels like 90% of the time whenever you try to do, whenever I try to do something with her and, and we were doing it with another friend, she always, something always comes up. So it's really aggravating. Um, and I'm in that space of, do you keep trying? But when it's so consistent, do you give up? But I like her a lot and it's fun to be with her, but it's so aggravating to have to keep trying over and over again. I've got another friend where it's like that. My birthday was in June and she's still trying to schedule getting together for my birthday. <laughs> and it's, you know, she, again, she's not feeling well. She's got this, she's got that. And I just, we were on the phone and, and she was, had so many obstacles to scheduling something. I just said, you know, you're the hardest person to schedule with. I really have a hard time finding time to get together with you. So after I said that, and I said it like that, I mean, I didn't say it with a lot of anger, but I think some frustration. Um, she did find a time <laughs> that we could just simply go out to dinner uh, and just spend a couple hours together. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been dealing with that a lot with friends. I think people, uh, really since the pandemic, I think people stay to themselves a little bit more and we do have a lot of COVID going around right now. So that may be spiking it. Um, I'll, that's, that wasn't meant to be a pun, but, um, that may be increasing, uh, people's isolation a little bit during these summer months, but, um, 
I don't know, it makes me, it does, for me, it relates to the idea of, do you stay and age in place where you are in your home? Or do you go someplace where, for me, it would mean more people, more activity, more things to to do, or do you stay in the comfort of your home? So when I think of my friends, um, it, it kind of also leads me to think about that topic as well. Um, but I guess that's it for now. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else going on. Not really. Tom's health is good. My health is fine and just trying to stay cool. And I will pass to Gina. I don't hear you. I don't hear you. Just again, like before. Say something. Mm -mm. No, I think we have Victoria first and you try to resolve this problem. Victoria, can you interrupt your banana? <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Your your uh, check in, Christine, because oh oh, so checking in. I'm in uh, La Mesa, California. Indeed, uh, the inland. Um, I'm the counterpart to Christine. It was 103 yesterday here, uh, where I live, and I have no air conditioning. And even the fans I have are like from the Middle Ages, you know, ceiling fans. I've got one going wildly here in the kitchen with no perceivable effect. Um, so I've been, yeah, it's been a struggle because I'm not used to the that kind of heat, um, especially when there's no reprieve, there's no, you know, no air conditioning or anything. Um, but what I wanted to say in my check-in, because maybe it'll be a theme, um, mm -hmm is indeed i just it just i mean it's 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 uncanny i was just thinking about a, an italian friend of mine that i haven't seen for many years she was actually a friend of my mother but mostly but um because the italian connection she was sort of my friend too who was a charming wonderful brilliant cultured sophisticated educated um woman wonderful um hostess uh, the, in the old style with the uh, linen tablecloths starched and well Heidi knows all that from the old Italy um, beautiful china and silver and glasses crystal mm. and she, I only went to her w w once to her apartment um, she always promised to do lots of entertaining but it never happened and when I went and saw how beautifully she you know that was her her upbringing, her background, but but then on the other side of things, she was always saying she would come to this and come to that, and we would meet up for this and we'd meet up for that, and it never happened. Um, once in a blue moon, we would see her somewhere or 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 have the promised lunch or dinner or whatever um, somewhere, or she would you know she was an art lover, art collector, so uh, she always promised to go to the openings, but rarely made an appearance, and. And once I had the, I guess the nerve or whatever to really, because I didn't know her that well, but I wanted to know what was behind that constant canceling and canceling and canceling. And it was sickness or it was something wrong with her son or this or that. There's always an excuse. And she told me that um, she was always in conflict because she was terribly, terribly, terribly depressed. And she, but she didn't want anybody to know it and and because she had this persona that was the opposite and she said when she canceled it she said you know when she canceled because of illness it, the illness was really her depression and um but she she only revealed that to me in sort of in the you know in a, in a sort of moment of being unguarded and i'm i realized that i've been doing the same thing um and and um I've been invited to a number of things lately where I had to literally, literally force myself to go. Um, one was a, 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 a very simple dinner at a, a meditation friend's 
um, condominium on the beach, and it was it was nice to get out of this this heavy inland heat. But right up until the last minute, I wanted to cancel. I was so tempted. And then I thought, well, never mind, because he, he's only here for like a week, a year or something. He lives in up so another part of California. And I thought, you know, it'll be more, it'll take more effort to reschedule. And, and he's not here very long. And beyond that, you know, I might as well just get it over with. And And when I was there, I had a great time. So it's it's not even that, like you said, Christine. When you're when you do see your friend, you have fun. It's great. It's fabulous. So that was chilling for me because I realized I'm I'm in that category. <laughs> like like this woman I was talking about before. Uh, she was. I, I didn't realize I was the same. Um, but but I, so I I have to fight really hard that impulse to to just cancel and not go anywhere. And I don't and I don't think it's the pandemic because I think. Well, it could be it, the pandemic might have made it worse. Anyway, I don't want to go on forever, but but it was so uncanny that like your whole share was like right exactly where my mind has been lately. So I'll pass. Gina, I hope we can hear you now. And I don't think we've met before, have we? So, OK, anyway, I hope we can you're, still hear you. We still can't hear you. No. Can you look down where the symbol of the microphone is? If you have not the right microphone, um, um. no, she she's not muted according to the. Yeah, the... I know, but you might not have tools in the right microphone on her computer. No, there is this little near the microphone. The okay, can you say something? No, I'm not yet. But she was talking when I came in the first time. Yes, mm -hmm. first. yeah, I, I could hear her before. Maybe it's just the mic that she has to push. Do we have? Did you push the button on your mic? Maybe this is. She had the earphone mic, and then yeah. she, she did something, and then we heard something. But then it. Well, maybe she should go out and come back, like I did. No, oh, it's. Maybe. No, it's not. It's <clears throat> not. Try the earphone mic again. Yeah, and otherwise you go out and come back. Then it. Okay, so. I can do my check in in the meantime, or I'm getting here some visitor. This is Lucy. It just rained a lot, and yesterday too, and I'm really happy because it was all so dry, and I feared my olives would fall down. So now they can develop, and I'm still looking for help for the harvest because this year doesn't seem to be anybody coming, not yet. I still hope somebody will show up. And um, yeah, I'm fine. Now it's a little cooler. It was like you say, I, I looked it up, 103 Fahrenheit is 39 centigrade. We had that for between 37 and 39, we had it for seven weeks, six or seven weeks. And that was quite long because this time, Normally it, it's a 10 days and then it's uh, slowing down a little bit and then other 10 days, but this year was the whole time. And now for a few days, it's nice. Oh, there is a oh, lovely rainbow, <coughs> beautiful. Anyway, I'm glad about that. And I feel again, having fun doing something outside because you, when it's so hot, you only lie in the in the chair and don't do anything, you know, and it's just not motivated. And since it's cooler, I'm starting to, to move again and do things and I like to be working outside. This topic, which you named, I find it perfect. Let's see if Gina is now he hearable. Can you Curable. Know? Yeah, yeah. Curable. <laughs> Technology is my favorite. Yeah. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, uh, Gina Donaldson calling you from Victoria, British Columbia. We had what we considered a heat wave, which was 29 Celsius. Uh, I do speak Fahrenheit in some terms, but we lost all that on a Saturday night. So we're back to our temperate temperatures of about 20. Uh, I live by the water, so I'm influenced by uh, what happens over the mountains and over the water and the tides. Uh, my interest is, is gardening. I just bought a whole bunch of new plants to uh, replace some of the winter kill that we had here. Uh, my last interview with uh, Heidi was about me going back to school. So I started school last week. It's absolutely terrifying. 
Uh, so I'm looking to to nestle into that, but my whole area of interest is in uh, older adults and learning and how do we have good quality of life. In terms of MAID, which is what we call the uh, palliative care assist assisted in dying here in Canada, I've actually had young friends who've had to choose that and because of their illness and a parent, uh, my friend's girlfriend's parent who chose that. And it's it's an interesting question because I think that we are not necessarily having a best quality of life for ourselves and our family. And when you reach that point, I think you should be able to make choices. And so I, I know I'm covering a couple of topics there, but uh, I welcome any discussion that talks about quality of life. I think that one of our biggest issues, uh, and I think it is post pandemic, uh, is that we were so, so prohibited from getting together in person that the tendency to get in, together in person for me personally has dropped. My girlfriend lives 15 minutes away. I talk to her more often than I see her. 15 minute walk. So like a village, not far. Right. Um, but I think we're just becoming very insular and it's going to be for me, it's, I'm fairly social, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work for me to get us back in routine where we're coming to each other's home for dinner every night or every other week or something. It's, We've, we've got into our bubbles, as we called them, and then we we stayed in our bubbles. Our bubbles didn't burst like they should have. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. it. So we can we can go with this topic. I can add that I find myself going out more in some way because I finally have people around me in, in the village and nearby with whom I can connect. That's not deep. Uh, um, not deep conversations like we are doing here, but socially nice. And so I enter in the, into a certain circle, which I never had here in, in my surrounding. And so at least once a week or twice a week, I meet with this one and with the other one and so on. And this is new for me. But I recognize the tendency to, for instance, I wouldn't go to Rome for a concert unless it's a person who I really, really, really wanted to see in my whole life, you know? Ye Yehudi Menuhin, somebody like this, yeah? somebody really big. I, I went uh, for um, Hesperion 20. I don't know if you know that. It's a, it was a group, um, Montserrat Figuras. They were doing uh, old music, ancient music, and beautifully, beautifully. Then I went about 10, 15 years ago, but she is dead now. And so these things I would go, but not for a normal concert. I have a uh, subscription for the Berliner Philharmonic, and every week I watch live what they are doing, and but alone, you know, so... But at least I have the illusion of being part of it because there is the interval, you have to wait when it goes. And so, yeah, there are these topics to have the tendency to be alone. And the other one is to go into um, a hospice, which I don't think in Austria is what I hear you talking about, uh, Gina, because in, in, except I think in Switzerland, we don't have the active. Um, um, how do you say suicide um, uh, uh, permission so I know somebody she went with a lot of money to Switzerland to have that done because she her life was uh, yeah well I, fo I found the topic that the pandemic has changed our social habits uh, quite interesting um and that people are as christine mentioned evading to commit to meet in public or in public places and um yeah that would be uh, but i don't see any way how we could change that and uh, I, i'm wondering if people when they are depressed, of course, they avoid meeting others, but uh, not everybody is depressed, is there? I, I couldn't think that everybody is depressed who avoids meeting. But Christine, would you say that your friend is also depressed? 
You you muted. <laughs> Actually, my first impression was she might be out an alcoholic, oh. and not <laughs> able to keep up with commitments. Now I'm not so sure about that. I, I that was probably an overreaction, but um. <sighs> Yeah, it could be depression or, you know, she's very social in some ways. I mean, outgoing. So I don't think it's social anxiety. I mean, a lot of people feel anxious, but, you know, when, when it's with your friends, typically you shouldn't feel too much social anxiety, but I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a puzzle. And I have another friend that we've been trying to schedule with her, the three of us, and, and she's come across this more times than I have. So she's very familiar with it. But well, I, think, I, am, I have uh, a tendency to hang in there though. Um, uh, Tom and I are different that way. If if somebody has done him wrong or, or behaved in a way that he doesn't like, he's perfectly willing to not <laughs> deal with them anymore. But I, I don't do that. I kind of readily keep, uh, try to keep my friends, um, by my side. So I've had an ongoing, um, conversation with, with, uh, a young woman that, um, I met at, at a, at a Harvard alumni event. And, um, she's actually, it, she's actually not, not, a, not much older than my daughter, but for some bizarre reason, I think of her as, as my peer and we've become friends. And, um, she has this theory about introverted extroverts and extroverted introverts and all this kind of stuff. And she, um, and I've, she insists that I'm like the, the, the most outrageous extrovert she's ever encountered in her entire existence. And she proudly labels herself as the ultimate, like quintessential textbook introvert. And we only meet at like happy hours, like Harvard happy hours and, and events and things like that. And um, so it's kind of interesting because I've, I've never actually met with her, just just the two of us um, somewhere. And what's interesting about it is that, um, well, I, I, anyway, I mean, you, Christine, you're a professional, so you you probably can speak to this more than any of us, but, but um, it, it intrigues me because I see that when I, once I get out and I am out, then I, then I am, I do appear very extroverted, but what, what I think of it as is that it's also relates to the fact that, um, that's why I never get stage fright, uh, when I perform, I, and I, I'm a public lecturer and I love it. I, I live for interaction with, with people. Um, but I don't think, I don't think of myself as an extrovert in the sense that, um, well, like, like this tendency that I just want to keep canceling engagements and don't want to go um implies to me the introvert part so so it is kind of a mystery that anyway I just wanted to mention that because I I it, it's something I've been thinking about lately on that score too that um what does what what how does that work that kind of like it's it's almost like a chemistry thing like yeast or something but like if you're in the context where you're supposed to like be activated like yeast in the dough then you do your thing but if if the yeast is sitting alone in a box in the cupboard, it's going to be it's not going to do that. You know what I mean? It's kind of a, like a catalyst thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's oh. a. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. You actually made it work. Before we um, continue, I, Gina, uh, could you yeah. tell us about your background? Your uh... oh, sure, sure, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we covered some stuff. So basically, my uh, background is in psychology. I've worked uh, in the armed forces in our Navy as a personnel administration officer. Uh, I met my husband in the Navy and so married my husband and left my uniform and went into consulting. My expertise is in change management. So uh, I help organizations go from where they are today to where they're aiming to be mostly translating strategy into um, the, the new way of working. So I'm very much the link between often management and uh, people who have to learn new things, which is where my interest in learning comes from. I also own a business called Personal Passage Planning, where I help people 
uh, plan for both planned events and unplanned events so that they're ready to respond uh, and recover from whatever that is. So getting, we would say getting your affairs in order, but I don't like saying affairs anymore, uh, but just making sure that you can or somebody else can help you if something happens to you. So everything from your banking information to uh, when I pass, this is the music I'd like to have to hear, or here are the sort of people I want you to let know that I'm not well, or here's my backup. So that's, that's my background. And uh, yeah, I've been, I've, we've moved a lot because in our country, our navies are on opposite coasts. So we're many miles away when we move. And so I've had lots of disruptions. Uh, so to tie back to the thread, I've had to start again in a lot of cities because if my Navy friends were on the other coast, it was distant. If I was coming into a new community, I had to see if they were interested in being friendly because sometimes they view it as is very transient and not worth it. So I think uh, between that and being an uh, officer and then being married to a senior officer, I think I've learned to be extroverted. I think intrinsically I would prefer not to, to be uh that way, but I've learned. And so it's a learned behavior that w people will get the impression that I'm very extroverted because I've taught myself how to do that. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that, thank you. You <laughs> wanted to say something for, for Victoria? To reply to re Victoria before mm -hmm. you interrupted, Tina? Was I supposed to say something to Victoria? I think you were starting to respond to her and then Monia asked you to tell something. Oh, about okay. Oh, Victoria. I well, I, I, I hope I circled it back. Uh, Victoria, to say, first of all, I loved your yeast analogy. Uh, and I think that that's what I was trying to say when you, if we pull ourselves out of our isolation, we could probably perform in social, but we have to make the movement from our comfort little nest bubble out. And then once we're there, we're fine. And you know, I think depression is an often too strong a word, but I think there's, we just haven't got that same get up and go energy maybe, or it just takes more effort because we're busier. Like, how can I be this busy at this time of my life? I don't know. But um, I think it was a really good analogy that if you get out there, it's probably worthwhile. I mean, I'm very shy in a classroom, but I found that the students and the faculty were extraordinarily welcoming. I'm like, okay, well, that's nice you know once you get out there it's okay and people I think other people like it when you make the effort to say hello because somebody has to say hello otherwise you both sit there <laughs> just yeah. a warning do not use yeast or dough as an analogy today <laughs> I spent the weekend trying probably my fourth or fifth attempt to master sourdough bread making and I made such a mess I ended up throwing the whole thing away after two days of nurturing and taking care of, I mean, actually started on Friday through Sunday, trying to take care of this nice little dough and it was a disaster. So I'm like, <laughs> had it. Oh, yeah. But I find it interesting because also I feel like um, being more introvert but then I have moments with total being absolutely extrovert. Sometimes uh, some sip of beer helps, you know, and... Uh... <laughs> but I do think, what did you say before? A learned extrovert? Learned, uh, uh, yeah. Something like this. Practiced. I, yeah. Well practiced. Yeah. And uh, I think um, as we are Women Matters, a group of women, I think many women are like this, you know, that mm -hmm. they are normally introvert and they have to learn extrovert or when they are extrovert, as we heard before, that can be also a cover up for being uh, shy or for, you know, for feeling not adequate and then uh, somebody goes out. What What is your idea, Christine, about that? Learn it extrover extroversion. <laughs> Are you asking me how it comes about? I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, what uh, if you observe that too in your practice, that people are maybe from the character introvert and they try to become extrovert for some reason or other, and either succeed or not. 
And the other question would be, can an extrovert learn to be a little bit more introvert? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think either way is possible. I see more people that are introverted because of the anxiety component. You know, they're just nervous. So they stay in their comfort zone, but they would like to go outside the comfort zone. So that's the more common problem. But yeah, I mean, some people, it, I don't call it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily extroversion, but some people recognize they maybe don't have the best social skills of recognizing when to be quiet, when to offer something. So um, they, some people who are talkative do want to learn how to inhibit that a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how can you learn that? How can you teach that? Um, well, it's best to be taught in a group setting where you're dealing with other people so that you can see if what happens when somebody tries to dominate a conversation mm -hmm. or you just get the person to recognize and be aware of their own behavioral cues, you know, pay attention to how long you've been talking, mm -hmm. um, pay attention if you're, you've gone off topic, there's just certain basics that you would want mm. them to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking before Monia and I about a friend of us uh, who I talked with her and Monia too. She has this habit to start talking and then doesn't end, uh, finish the sentence and then she starts again. And then at the end, she says everything three times, but only half all the time, you know? And this is... I told her some time, and fortunately, she is not um, angry about that. She is not realizing that this is difficult to understand her, and then it might be push away people because, I mean, if you have to listen like this, and she starts the sentence, and then she says, yeah, yeah, and as if we could read her, her thoughts, you know, and <laughs> so in my case, is to make her realize this. Uh, Victoria? I have, yeah, I have a question because um, cause Beatrice, well, Beatrice isn't the only one, but um, uh, other people say that that I do that all the time. Um, and uh, have I just wondered, since you've known me for some time, have you noticed it in this context that I'll start a sentence and then I, and then somehow I go on to another su or subject or I don't finish the sentence because because Beatrice claims it's all the time and I'm completely incomprehensible and she's always waiting for the end of the sentence and it never comes because I've gone on to something else. Mm. Mm. Well, sometimes I mean I wouldn't say it's a consistent thing, but sometimes yeah. And me sometimes too. But it's not like in the case we were talking with Monia that, uh, yeah. you know. But and, and, uh, Victoria, since you were asking, I noticed that you have so many subjects in your head that you just jump from one to the next and this also fits in. And so, uh, yeah, it's like flooded with uh, things you are really interested in and uh, want to communicate but so to reduce that yeah she i don't know how. communicate everything she wants to explain everything and mm -hmm. so that it gets so de de how do you say expanded instead of concentrating on the important thing then you try to get in this and this and this and this yeah that's maybe but it's not that you don't finish the sentence or maybe oh, I, any <laughs> I find for myself that I have conversations in my head all the time unfortunately that monkey monkey mind you know my thoughts are going and then sometimes when I do speak up I am very familiar with my thought and yet mm -hmm. I don't I'm not paying attention to the fact that the listener doesn't know hasn't been part of my own internal conversation so they don't know as well what I'm talking about and I do have to pay more attention to whether I'm making any sense to them because again in my mind I've had this well-developed conversation <laughs> yeah it's tricky isn't it <laughs> 
uh, what is the need for these conversations? Because I stop them with a mantra usually, the old Buddhist practice. Yeah, or um, I just try to use breathing when I'm aware of it, or just quiet. Just yeah. tell myself to be quiet, silence. What that is your is mantra, Manya, or is it a secret one? No, I have lots of mantras. For every occasion, I have a mantra. <laughs> Uh, I have oh, one lot of for going to sleep uh, that will influence your dreams so I can use it in my dreams if I don't like my dreams then they just fade when I use it and uh, yeah oh there are lots of mantras and I uh, just uh, like uh, I mentioned them before like Om Namo Narayanaya or uh, Kati Kati Parakati Parasamkati to uh, remind me of that everything is just uh, co continuously changing. Yeah, om kati kati, so walking, walking, continuing walking, more walking than arriving at the other shore. And this is Bodhi, so this is the awareness. That's one of my favorite mantras, the kati kati. Mm -hmm. You chant them or just say them? I chant them, I chant them in my mind only. I don't chant them aloud when I go to sleep. So that would... <laughs> Your husband. <laughs> <laughs> no, my husband sleeps in a different room, but nevertheless, uh, I wouldn't... Uh, no, that would keep me awake. So it's just to slide into dreams. Why did you ask? Oh, I'm always on the hunt for good mantras. So... <laughs> I may send you an email and ask you to send me a, a curated list of good mantras. Do you have one? Well, I, I, um, the 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 Buddhist ones I only do in the context of actual chanting. Um, uh -huh. the, like a lot of the, but I don't know if they're they're not mantras. They're refuges and things like that that I've learned. I mean, in various of like retreats I've been on and things. So I know, I know a lot of them now because a couple of my teachers um, are monast Buddhist monastics. So they, they start every retreat with the chanting. Um, and I love those. No, my, my, I'm in the, mine are all, all uh, Christian. Well, lately I, I'm in a prayer community. Uh, it's called Monasteries of the Heart, um, which was started by Sister Joan Chittister, who's a very prolific, beloved Benedictine nun who's totally um, unconventional in every respect, politically, spiritually. Oh, Gina's nodding. Do you know her, her work? Yeah. And um, no, but I I do know of nuns like this, and I find them fascinating. Oh yeah, yeah. They're very the liberated nuns are are way ahead of everybody else. I don't know if it's. I mean, that would be a that would be a, maybe a future topic for Women Matters that. The um, implicit greater enlightenment of women, <laughs> as opposed to men, um, but but they were the last meeting we had. They were people were talking about prayer. Um, so this is a contemplative Christian, but ecumenical. They're they're from all different. Um, well, and lots of them wouldn't even identify with any particular aspect of Christianity except sort of the generic. Um, but one woman was saying she gave up all prayer because she decided it was impertinent and and um arrogant you know like giving god what she called a laundry list of you know do this <laughs> that to the other <laughs> and then another woman said that um you know that that for her prayer was always seemed like the list of gifts you want from santa claus so she she when she said when she matured that seemed ridiculous too so everyone was kind of sharing and and um, and I said that for me, may maybe because my head is racing all the time, um, I when it's time to pray in any context or when I feel like I should pray, I I that's the time when I I don't I can't have I don't have any words at all, literally, no matter how many issues are in going on in my life or how many things I'm concerned about or worried about or where I feel I need guidance or need some kind of insight or wisdom. It's it's and so that's been really interesting that it 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 just it feels like falling into silence in a way that's very healing where the, the that that monkey mind 
suddenly stops. And so, so that's been my experience lately that, um, which is interesting because it's, it's, I didn't plan it or think it through intellectually. Oh, this is, this is the right way to pray is just be in silence. Um, I can't do it when I try to do it consciously, like, like, like meditation, same thing. I can meditate spontaneously, you know, swimming in my pool, looking at the hummingbirds. But I, if I sit in the chair and I'm supposed to meditate for 20 minutes, forget it. Then the monkey mind goes just berserk. It's like, ah, now we have this opportunity to really make you crazy, you know, and then the mind, the mind goes just, it's, it's out of control. So that's something I'd like to learn too, is how to, um, yeah, the training of the mind. It, it's interesting um, that there's there was a Snoopy's ca cartoon, which I remembered so clearly. Uh, and it quoted the Bible, which I it's like Corinthians 2. And it said that uh, you, you never have to put your prayers into words because God knows them from the silence. And I'm like, well, that's pretty profound. He already knows or she already knows or whatever your belief system is. But something about it isn't false words in that sense or whatever, whatever you attach to the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Monia, you wanted to say something, but you were muted. I just noticed that Victoria didn't finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Because she asked, so yeah, yeah, I never paid attention there, but the verb was missing. So yeah, but the the, the insert was interesting too. So yeah. I mean, regarding the topic of where we all want to end up at the end of our lives, I don't know. I, I do think about it pretty often maybe not daily but you know frequently and uh my my conclusion now is i guess i want to stay in my home as long as i can leave my home <laughs> as long as i can get out into the community my home would be a safe and comfortable base from which to operate but I don't welcome the idea of being kind of confined to my home um, and have to depend upon other people coming to me, whether it's my children, adult children, or a caregiver or a friend to visit. It just seems um, too lonely. And I think then if I was really in a home by myself, in my own home by myself, I'd probably prefer to be in a facility, hopefully where the care is good, um, but be around people. I guess maybe I'm an extrovert <laughs> that I don't really like the idea, although I don't mind being alone and I do a lot of things by myself. Um, I don't relish the idea of kind of waiting around and you know not seeing anybody. I'd rather be observing people and watching and, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't know if that fits for anybody else. I have friends who are much older than me and they find that they are lonely in their home and, but they need something to look forward to. So sometimes they force themselves to go shopping, even though just one little thing to go out of the home. But, uh, it, that, I think I think the thing in your home is if you have virtual contact, is that enough? Do you have touching? Is somebody touching you? Is somebody giving you a hug? Are you feeling that different comfort that comes with in person? And I think that if people are either unsafe in their home, unlonely in their home, unable to provide their best meals, then something to go to if you can if you you need something, you need something social and entertaining yourself in your home, I think just makes your world smaller. So uh, you can, you can, you can amuse yourself, but it's a lonely amusement if you don't have contact with other people. 
I have two friends who complain literally 24 hours a day about their loneliness. And over the years, I've made millions of suggestions of um, based on, because I know them well, uh, based on their interests. Do the, Why don't you go to this thing or th that thing or join this group or that group or try this out or try that out? And they always push back. They always have a reason not to. And and it's so interesting to me. But well, I guess I'm sort sort of circling back to the introvert extrovert thing, that um, that inability to break out of the cocoon of loneliness, even though they really genuinely, I mean, I, these are two friends I know really really well. They they long for human companionship. They just they're they're starved. And yet they cannot make that move even, I mean, one of my friends is, is uh, one of them is in, in New York and um, every time I am in New York, I'm almost, you know, forcing him at gunpoint to do all these things with me and he, and he thrives on it, but, but, you know, I can't, then I go back to California and then, and then he sends me a text of, you know, his lonely existence and it's so baffling to me and so frustrating because I, I just want to sort of shake him and say, especially in New York, it's one thing if you're, you know, in a community that's more insular, like I think California, because we live in our cars, it's a different kind of a world. But even here, it's possible. So I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, that's so mysterious to me, this inability when you know what you need, you know what you want. It's kind of like knowing you need certain nutrition, but you just live on coffee and cigarettes or something. I mean, it just, it's just unfathomable. I don't know. I hear a lot of people, and this is true of myself sometimes, It it the initiation is the hard part. You know, it, it's the starting some, into something, whether it's a project or going somewhere or having a social contact. And then once you're there, you know, everybody goes, oh, that was fun. I enjoyed it. Let's do it again. And then, you know, you kind of settle back into, you know, not doing it. Um, the initiation, and that's a hard thing sometimes to overcome. You need motivation. Yeah. I often tell people who want, they'll indicate they want something and then have all the reasons why not. And I just point that out that, you know, sometimes they start with all the obstacles, the why nots, um, and it immediately shuts down the possibility that they're going to do it, you know, if that's where they're starting from. So sometimes people aren't aware that they do that, that they're considering all the reasons why something might not go well, and it kills their motivation. Is it fearfulness or is it also, how do you say that, a laziness, laziness? I think it's anxiety that? dealing with the uncertainty. They, you know, they're dealing with the fact that they don't know what's going to happen. And they've got all these ideas in their mind of what, what may, why it may not go well, why it may not go smoothly, or why, you know, this one woman wanted to do volunteering, and yet she had a whole lot of reasons why it might not work. Maybe, <laughs> and trying to get her just to stop listing all the potential problems and really go more with the the energy that's propelling her to do that mm -hmm. and it's hard to to put aside the what ifs anxiety i remember that jordan peterson who said that people prefer the known hell to the unknown heaven <laughs> so, yeah yeah i guess a lot of it is just inertia that once you're settled in, I mean, I know that even in my house, it's once I settle in a space, it's even if I'm uncomfortable, it's the effort it takes to get up and move to a different part of the house it seems almost insurmountable. It's, I mean, there's a there's something real to the inertia of, um, and, and I suppose also not just physical inertia, but just 
the mental inertia to move to the next idea or the next activity or and fear of the unknown, I guess, is a big piece. Yeah, and then it's also when we are talking about elder people, we are, we, at least in my youth, we were, people were 60 were old and we're supposed to, to go, you know, more or less. And then you have to convince yourself that you are not old and that you have all the possibilities and to continue to 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 explore things and everything that this is normal i mean i see here people uh, in the in the village who are only at the doctors all the time and eat pills all the time you know and when i go to a doctor and they always ask what medicines do you take and i say none and then they look as well how is that possible you know so it depends on your uh, how do you say pregong on your uh, imprint and um, what what you think is is possible and if you think with 60 you are old then you are old i mean no maybe with 20 is still different when you don't go to social events or third with 30 but with 60 this sort of a confirmation yeah you are old you don't need to go anymore you know you can stay home it's, it's retirement and so be quiet <laughs> yeah Monia, there's a lot of was... ageism yeah Monia what was your reaction to your friends shifting her location well um she is worried about because they have to share a room in the beginning that she has to share a room with another old woman and or going to the toilet and farting and so she really um but i was when i while i was listening to you all it's uh she is lonely so maybe she prefers to be with other people and and she she was delighted about this uh the, the woman who was vis visiting her of the, of the mobile team and I'm sure that this woman attracts her to go there because they are the way she talks to her and she misses that. Um, I don't visit her anymore because it's exhausting for her to be visit, even to make herself a cup of tea is exhausting already. So she's really ready to go. She's 87. And yeah. I guess it's it's a, a good solution, a good decision to make and you have to make it. Sometimes you have to make it and it's uh yeah. I have a very strange um, example, you know, I have the dog who is t 10 years old and up to eight years she was alone and she had an illness and afterwards she went really like lazy everything. And then the new dog came and she succeeded to push the other one. She is not like before, but at least sometimes she runs around and she is not anymore like this all the time so transferring it to humans maybe it's not so bad as it was once that the old people were in the house where the children were mm -hmm. so they got some inspiration and some how do you say kick in the ass <laughs> i think that alone would be a great topic for a future conversation um because i think that the um my experiences of living like in japan for example where they still have the tradition of the three generation household and it is it's it's so dramatically different from our culture that because it's everyone benefits from everyone else because you don't have to do the whole babysitting thing when the children are young because you've got the the grandmother or grandfather whatever um, the children learn from the wisdom of the old, the old get energy from the young and feel they have a purpose. And they also can convey their wisdom to somebody that actually cares. The middle generation, the parents um, can 
be, you know, incredibly ambitious and, you know, focus on their careers without feeling guilty because they know they still have this family that's intact. Um, I think it's a huge, I, I think the loneliness epidemic, which it, everyone's talking about nowadays, I mean, all over the world is, I would say it's probably, in in many ways, it's probably due to that fact that the the family unit has been, you know, has been sort of eroded by all kinds of um, all kinds of factors. On that note, um, I have I have a have to go to a doctor's appointment. Um, so I'm sorry to I'm sorry to hold forth at the end, but, but now we have like like five topics that came up today that were all actually fascinating. Um, so I'll say I'm just going to check out and I'm sorry to miss your checkouts, but I, I, if they won't let me in after five minutes, so. Okay. <laughs> see, you, see you next time. Great to see you. Nice to meet you, Gina. Thanks. You too. <laughs> Bye. So maybe the question is what brought us about that we have lost this possibility to stay together as families, you know, that might also be another topic. What is it? I'll write it down. Uh, I couldn't. But could you specify the topic? <laughs> I'll write it down, Heidi. Uh, why uh, does did it happen in our societies that the loneliness appears like this, and that we we uh, deliberately, in some sense, uh, uh, lose the opportunity of the mutual benefit in a in a in a three generation. <clears throat> You know, it yeah. seems so normal, even now that the mothers uh, uh, educate their children alone, even without a husband. So the mm -hmm. loneliness is in all generations, you know, so the children are It's a great topic. Yeah, It's a great topic, yeah. because if we can look at, <clears throat> sorry, the aspects of loneliness, the evolution mm -hmm. of loneliness, um, and not blame it only on where you live with your family, but the many factors, I would be very keen on talking about that. Okay. okay well, so uh, I, I'm sort of lucky because we live about a block away from our children, from one daughter. And, uh, but having them in the same house would be, I would feel crowded. So. <laughs> uh, but you have a, a flat. Hmm? Or they had big houses where the before they had big people had big houses where the oh. older ones were in a certain part and the younger ones were in the other part. Now you have a flat for three rooms and how do you put everybody in there? So I mean, also this is a factor why this came about. No, the cost of of uh, of, of cost of, of house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's explore that next time. Okay. And I would say thank you and uh, see you in two weeks. And have a good day. Nice to have... meet everyone. Take... <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. We have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>